Hello everyone, in this video I'm going to be showing the entire assembly process of an FFR SC1 chassis. From selecting and modifying the body, figuring out what dimensions are needed to ensure that it will fit, and fully assembling a rolling chassis with all necessary suspension, steering, and drivetrain components ready for electronics. I've already made quite a few videos where I use this chassis, and I've even made some videos where I've showcased the design process. But with the first batch of files now released, and compatible suspension and drivetrain components now available as well, I wanted to make this video as more of a standalone, basic assembly tutorial, providing information and showing the assembly process for anyone wanting to build a vehicle utilizing this chassis. For anyone who is unfamiliar with the FFR SC1, it's a small 124th to 125th scale FDM 3D printable, front motor, rear wheel drive, solid axle chassis designed for use with lightweight bodies such as ones from a plastic model car kit. STL files for all the parts that can be printed on a typical FDM printer are available for anyone to download. All of these parts can also be ordered from the Make It RC store if you don't own a printer or are having trouble printing some of the more intricate parts. This chassis design is compatible with different suspension and drivetrain assemblies, such as the MA-10 axle and ms one steering and suspension assembly, along with more compatible components coming soon. I always start with the model kit that I want to use with this chassis. For this tutorial, I'm using a Monogram 124 scale 1965 Shelby GT350. A wide variety of different model car kits and bodies can be used with this chassis. In general, the lighter the body, the better. The FFR SC1's front mounted motor and solid axle rear end does a good job of replicating the general appearance of older vehicles, utilizing a solid axle rear suspension such as this Mustang. I go ahead and unbox all of the parts that are included with this kit, but for this tutorial the only component I'll really be utilizing is the body. The body looks great and isn't so small that it will make finding a spot for all of the electronics too difficult or would be too small for this chassis. The body will however need to be modified in order to ensure that it will not interfere with the front wheels, suspension, and motor. These inner fender and firewall sections that are molded as a part of the body will need to be cut out. I start by marking where I want to make the cut, and then I used a hot knife to effortlessly cut through the plastic and remove these sections. With these sections removed, I now have plenty of room under the hood. Before moving on, I did want to clean up the edge a little by filing and sanding around where I cut. With those sections removed and the edges now sanded, I'll move on to the next step which is determining the outer track width, wheelbase, and width between the rocker panels. A great tool that makes this process much easier is utilizing this adjustable mock-up chassis that I designed and assembled in a previous video. I'll be sure to leave a link to that video below in the description, and I'll also leave a link to the page where you can download all of the STL files for this mock-up chassis. I started by figuring out the wheelbase by loosening up two of the nuts and adjusting the chassis until the wheels are positioned correctly in the wheel arches. Next I determine the outer track width by positioning the wheels out far enough so that they look correct, but not too far out to where the wheels might come into contact with the body when the suspension moves or when turning. I always like to lean on the side of making things narrower so I know for sure that it will work, rather than trying to make the width as wide as possible and run the risk of the wheels colliding with the body. Of course one option if this does occur is you can always modify the wheel wells to accommodate the wheels. The final measurement I take is simply from one bottom edge of the rocker panel to the other. This is so I know how wide of a main chassis piece I can choose for this body, which I will talk more about later. Once I've determined the length of all these measurements, I can move on to the next step which is choosing the correct chassis pieces and printing them. The chassis consists of three parts. 
The main chassis piece is what I'll choose first. First I select the width of the chassis, making sure that it will fit between the body's rocker panels. I also ensure that the main chassis piece that I choose is the correct wheelbase and compatible with the 53mm MA10 axle that I'll be using. I've decided to print both a 112mm and a 113mm wheelbase version so I can compare the two and select the one that fits best. More sizes and variations will be added as time goes on. Ensuring the dimensional accuracy and overall quality of the part is important to ensure that all of the components you print will fit together well. Settings will vary from printer to printer, though we do have some general printing guidelines available on a page linked below in the description. Next I print the over axle piece. Once again I make sure that I'm selecting the correct one for the axle that I'm using. After that I print out the rear piece. I decided to print out both variations so I can test fit each of them and decide which one I want to use. I also printed out a 1.6mm spacer for the front suspension assembly, a RFM1 motor mount, and SVA steering servo mounts. I remove any support material and inspect all of the parts. Although there are a few minor surface imperfections here and there on some of the parts, overall everything's looking good. They are dimensionally accurate and there is no warping during printing or any other issues. To further clean up the parts, I used a hobby knife and some sandpaper to smooth some of the edges. I also make sure that all of the parts fit together correctly. Now I can move on to assembling the chassis. All of the necessary hardware can be ordered from the Make It RC store. Rather than fully assembling the chassis and then installing all of the suspension components, I'm going to be installing the suspension before completely assembling the chassis. I'll explain the reason for doing this later on. I'm going to be using this 53mm MA10 axle assembly with this chassis. I've already created a separate tutorial video showing the assembly process of an MA10 axle assembly, which I'll include a link to that video below in the description. I'm going to start by installing the lower trailing arms. The trailing arms and panhard bar that I'm using are all one piece resin links. These are nice because they are the exact length, which makes installing them very easy, but they do have a bit of flex. Under normal driving conditions, this shouldn't ever be an issue, however, if you'd rather have stronger steel links, just the trailing arm and panhard bar ends are available, which can be secured to the end of a 1.5mm steel rod that can be cut to the correct length. I noticed a few minor imperfections on the ball end of the socket, which I lightly sanded away before applying some grease and then pressing the socket end of the trailing arm into place. Next I install the upper control arm onto the axle. Before doing so, I make sure that the opposite end will fit between the opening on the chassis. I use a hobby knife and some sandpaper to make sure that the opening is wide enough. I then carefully installed it by using a 1 by 4 mm screw. Make sure that you do not over tighten it, although fortunately if you're having issues getting it tight enough or the screw is coming loose, you can always insert a longer M1 fastener with a nut on the end to hold the arm in place instead of just threading the screw into the axle. Next mount the panhard bar to the axle using a M1.6 by 5 mm screw. Again be careful not to over tighten it. If you feel that any of these connections are too stiff, you can use some grease. Before I begin to mount the rear axle and suspension links to the chassis, I first install the over axle piece. 
I sand the two joining surfaces to ensure that they are flat and that they will fit together snug. Optionally, I like to use a little bit of super glue to help secure the pieces. Of course, the disadvantage to using glue is that it will make disassembling these parts much more difficult if it ever needs to be done. I used the two M2 screws to secure the overaxle piece to the main chassis piece. It's important that the overaxle piece is parallel to the ground and is solidly attached to the rest of the chassis. Using the two M1.6 screws that are included with the lower trailing arms, mount them to the chassis. Make sure that the trailing arms can move freely without any resistance. Next, I secure the upper control arm to the chassis using the hardware that is included with the upper control arm. I then cut the springs to the length that I want and install them between the over axle piece and the axle. Start with the springs longer than what you think you need since you can always trim away more material. Always keep in mind that the weight added to the chassis is going to compress the springs and lower the ride height, especially with softer springs. Don't try to set the ride height until you know the effect that the weight is going to have on the suspension. To keep the springs from coming out and to prevent the axle from dropping, the easiest thing to do is to just use a small amount of glue to hold the springs in place. You want enough to keep them solid, but not too much so that they can still be easily removed if you need to change them. I find that just using a small dab of super glue applied with a pin or a toothpick is sufficient. If you're feeling a little more ambitious, you can also make some limiting straps to prevent the axle from dropping down too far. Finally, I can install the panhard bar, as well as demonstrate why I haven't fully assembled the chassis. As you can see with the 53mm M810 axle assembly, the panhard bar to chassis mount is not accessible with the rear piece mounted, so I make sure to do this before installing the rear piece. I printed out both currently available rear pieces, so I have the option of figuring out which one I want to install. I do a quick mock-up to figure out how much room I have in the rear. I repeated the same process I did for mounting the overaxle piece. This time, however, I need to be a little more careful to ensure that I'm not putting too much stress on the overaxle piece or any of the rear suspension components. There are also three screws to install this time. The chassis is now fully assembled and the rear axle as well as the suspension is fully installed. Next, I move on to assembling the RFM1 motor mount and gear assembly as well as the drive shaft. I start by sanding the joining surfaces of each half of the motor mount so that they will fit together snug. I then slide the two bearings onto each end of the lower gear. After that, I install the lower gear and bearing assembly into the mount. As long as the dimensions of the 3D printed motor mount pieces are correct, the bearing should fit in a place without issue, and the lower gear should spin with no resistance. Each half of the motor mount is secured using two M1.6 by 5mm screws. 
Next, I install the drive shaft socket onto the end of the lower gear shaft. The drive shaft socket used here, as well as the process to install it, is the same as it is on the MA10 axle assembly. After ensuring that the two parts are aligned, I carefully install the included screw. Next, press fit the upper gear onto the motor shaft. Before I install the motor mount onto the chassis, I first figure out how long I need to make the drive shaft. I start by taking a rough measurement and then cut a 1.5mm steel rod to that length. After test fitting, I removed more material until it was the correct length. The drive shaft ends are then glued onto the rod using an adhesive designed for bonding to metal. I also apply some grease to each end before installing it. Once the drive shaft is in place, the motor mount can be secured to the chassis. For the two screws that are closest to the front of the car, use M1.6 by 6mm screws, and for the two that are closer to the rear, use M1.6 by 5mm screws. Secure the motor using the included M2 screws. Make sure that the motor is positioned so that the gears can spin freely. One important thing to keep in mind is that this RF130CH09520 motor provides a ton of power and speed, to the point where some might find it to be a bit overkill and it could even potentially damage some of the drivetrain components. Because of this, I highly recommend adjusting the settings on your transmitter accordingly. We're currently in the process of implementing some lower power motors that will be made compatible with this chassis. Next, I install the front suspension and steering assembly. This process will vary depending on what setup you choose, though the process should be pretty straightforward. For this chassis, I'm installing this MC01 EP suspension and steering assembly. The complete assembly process of this will be covered in a separate video. To mount this to the chassis, I use the 1.6mm spacer that I printed earlier that will be placed between the main chassis piece and this front suspension assembly. I use four M1.6 by 6 mm screws to secure it. I make sure that it is installed level with the rest of the chassis and not at an angle. I'm also careful not to apply too much pressure to the motor, which is being supported from one end by the motor mount. With this particular assembly, it probably would have been easier to mount it before installing the motor mount. With the front suspension and steering assembly securely attached, I can now move on to adding the SVA steering servo. I started by installing the servo arm, which I cleaned up a bit with a hobby knife, and then mounted the steering linkage socket to the end, making sure to first apply some grease. I then pressed it onto the servo spline and installed the screw to hold it on. After that, I secured each servo mount using M1.6 by 4 mm screws. Next, I needed to cut a section of 1.5 mm steel rod to go from the servo to the steering linkage. Getting the length exact is not too critical since the trim can always be adjusted via the transmitter. I do try to get it as close as possible. Just like with the drive shaft, after it's been cut to length and test fit, I glue each end. <laughs> 
Before installing the wheels, I wanted to apply some grease to the gears and also apply a little bit of water washable glue, like what you might use to aid with 3D print bed adhesion, to the nut that secures the upper control arm to prevent it from coming loose, but still allow it to be easily removed when needed. Loctite or something similar would also work. I selected wheels that were the size that I wanted and also had the correct offset and backspacing I want for this car. I also selected tires that are compatible with these wheels. I once again used a hobby knife and some sandpaper to clean up any imperfections from the back left from printing. I also cleaned up the back side of the tires a little bit as well. I then simply pressed the wheels inside the tires. Depending on the fit, you will more than likely want to use some water washable glue to help secure the tire onto the wheel. But for now I'm skipping this step since the wheels will more than likely be painted, so there's no point in gluing the tires on until after the wheels have been painted. These wheels are mounted just like they would be on any other conventional RC car. I slide the wheel onto the shaft, making sure that it is fully seated onto the wheel mount, and then I use a M2 nut to secure the wheel. Although lock nuts can be used, I much prefer to use a standard nut with a little bit of water washable glue to help keep them from loosening. This allows the wheels to be much easier to remove and does not put as much stress on the wheel mounts when tightening or loosening the nut. I make sure that the chassis can roll easily without any significant resistance, and I also make sure that the suspension can move smoothly as well. I now have a complete rolling chassis ready for the electronics and for the body to be mounted to it. I hope this video has provided you with some useful information. We are continuing to expand the variety of compatible components and variations of this chassis as time goes on, but the general assembly process will remain the same. More information can be found at the links below in the description. At the time of this video's release, the quantity available of some compatible components is limited, however we are working to increase our stock as well as the selection of products. So if you don't see what you're looking for or an item is out of stock, be sure to check back in the coming weeks and also follow us at the social media pages linked below for more updates. If you have any questions, feel free to leave a comment down below or send us an email. Also, as cool as it would be to continue building this car, since I've got plenty of projects to keep me occupied for now, I've decided to go ahead and sell this chassis along with the model kit and some additional parts. A link with more information will be below in the description. Anyways, thank you all very much for watching, and I will see you next time.